Okay, I think we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining the Kelty Mental Health Resource Center's webinar, Building a Shared Understanding of Mental Health and Substance Use in School Communities. And in this webinar, we're going to be sharing the new Language Matters resource that we've developed in partnership with the BC Ministry of Education and Childcare. My name is Michelle Chamfrone. I'm a program manager with the Health Promotion and Health Literacy Team at BC Children's Hospital. Um, I would like to start by respectfully acknowledging that BC Children's Hospital and the Kelty Mental Health Resource Centre are located on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And in the resource that we're going to be sharing, um, we talk about the importance of knowing and understanding how the ongoing effects of settler colonialism, intergenerational trauma, and racism have disproportionately affected and continue to affect the mental health and wellness of Indigenous people. And so as we begin our, our discussion and any time we're having uh, talking about child and youth mental health um, and supporting child and youth mental health, it's important to have that context. So I wanted to share it here as well at the beginning. So our BC Children's Hospital Health Promotion and Health Literacy Team works to support the mental health and well-being of BC's children's youth and families. And our team offers um, a variety of different services and supports, particularly for schools and school communities. So we offer support with mental health promotion planning and implementation. Our Kelty Mental Health Resource Center has resources and support for parents and caregivers. And we also offer support for school counselors and other clinicians who are supporting the mental health and substance use care of their students through our compassbc.ca resource. So uh, I encourage you to check out those resources as well. And for, for today's session, so the webinar that, that we're sharing today and for the Language Matters resource, um, this was developed by our school health promotion team. And the school health promotion team works collaboratively, collaboratively to support schools in promoting mental health and well-being of their students by providing coaching resources and professional learning opportunities such as this webinar. So a few housekeeping things now that I see quite a few people have joined. So welcome everybody to the webinar. Um, so you've all, uh, your cameras are turned off and you've been muted automatically. If you have questions, so we will have a Q&A session with the panelists. So once we get to that, you can submit questions to the speakers through the Q&A button. If you have technical questions or, or issues that you want to, uh, you want to, to address to our hosts, um, you can do that through the chat function, and uh, Mari and Erica will be helping to address the, any of those kinds of questions. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we're going to have a survey link that pops up that we really encourage you to complete the survey. And the webinar is being recorded, and it will be available on the Kelty Mental Health Resource Center website. Uh, so just uh, for our agenda, just briefly, we're going to do an introduction and overview of the resource. Hopefully some people have had a chance to take a look at it already, um, but we'll go through the, the content of it. Uh, we'll have a panel discussion with some great panelists sharing their perspective on the resource and a Q&A and then wrap up. So I'm very pleased to introduce, um, to open, to talk about the project from the Ministry of Education and Child Care, Danielle Carter Sullivan. She's the Executive Director of Early Learning, Mental Health and Student Safety. Thanks so much, Danielle, for being here. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much for that great introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm looking at participant numbers, 112, that's fantastic. So excited to be able to launch this today uh, and have folks interact with the tool and ask some great questions and have the panel be uh, able to share some of their insight about it. Um, language matters. And it's something that we think about quite often uh, at the Ministry of Education and Childcare. Uh, that clarity around language, that clarity around understanding is really the impetus for why we said, what are we going to do in terms of addressing uh, language around uh, some of the work that we do in uh, mental health and substance use? So 
just kind of posing some questions, the why. So in the beginning of 2023, um, we said this matters. And so how are we going to address it? And it's part of our mental health and school strategy. So for those of you who are not familiar with that, it's available on our race site alongside uh, this tool as well. So I encourage you to go and have a look at it. And it's really just also completing an action item that we identified a number of years ago within that strategy. So what is it? Um, it's really a resource that's aimed at bridging conversations for folks, um, both working in school communities and the greater community to really think about how we can improve and support one another around mental health and substance use needs, that common language, that common understanding. How did we develop it? And Michelle alluded to this a bit around the working group, um, but we also have the advisory council. We did engagement with K-12 education partners, subject matter experts, indigenous voices and perspectives, and a whole group of folks have contributed to making this tool what it is today. Who's it designed for? So it's designed for educators, for administrators, for school support staff, for families, for students themselves, and any other personnel who work with children and youth in school communities. And again, just a reminder that it's available on our ERASE website. I wanna thank you, Michelle, and thank your team for all of the work. I know there's a lot that goes into this. It's a fantastic document. I think everyone that's contributed such valuable information and insight into creating this tool. Uh, I hope it's uh, a value to you in the field as you start to now work with it. And um, I'm really excited about the webinar today and uh, learning from you and from the panel as well about how to use this guide and uh, see what it, it holds for us in the future. So thanks so much, Michelle. I hope it I hope you all take away some great learnings and lessons as part of this uh, panel. And uh, back to you, Michelle. Thank you so much. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so thanks so much for that, that great overview and introduction. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Alex Gist, who is a health promotion specialist with our BC Children's Hospital team and was the, the lead project manager on this project. So All Alex. Right. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, and thanks, Danielle. And hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit more all, uh, about the guide. So uh, I'll build off of what uh, Danielle said and providing a brief overview of the guide. Uh, and I'll do a quick walkthrough of the resource. And then I'll uh, introduce our panelists for discussion on the guide. And we'll have a few questions for Q and uh, for a few questions, time for questions. So uh, if you have any questions about the guide or questions for the panelists now or as uh, as I'm talking, as the panelists are talking, please uh, use the Q&A button to ask them and start putting them in, in there right uh, as soon as now. So, um, so uh, yeah, so this the Language Matters Guide is really meant to be an introductory resource on mental health and substance use for school communities. And, and uh, I do want to highlight that introductory nature of it. It's kind of meant to be, a, you know, the 101 level uh, resource. There's a lot of other great tools and resources out there for folks who are have already uh, um, already have a good uh, baseline knowledge about mental health and, and substance use in, in school communities, uh, so, you know, for the 401 level, but for that 101 level, this is the, this is really hopefully uh, going to be a really good and useful guide. Um, and, uh, and we're really hoping that it can can build that common understanding, that common that baseline understanding of mental health and well being to really help uh, folks within and, and across uh, uh, within the education sector and, and between sectors um, be on the same on the same page. And as Danielle mentioned, it it does uh, address a key action from the mental health uh, in schools. Uh, strategy to develop a common language and understanding of mental health terms to improve mental health literacy and reduce stigma. Um, and again, as, as Danielle was mentioning, the, it's, the audience is quite broad, educators, administrators, school support staff, and school community partners, and really thinking about, like, about those school community partners, not just uh, limited to uh, education folks, but um, you know, health, health professionals, public health, and community organizations who work along who work in schools or or alongside schools to support student mental health and well-being. 
Uh, and as well, it can be shared with parents and guardians and caregivers, health professionals who work with school-aged children and youth. Uh, and in terms, uh, again, building off of what Danielle said, in terms of the uh, aims of the guide, so um, just really to define key mental health and substance use terms and concepts, uh, to discuss the role of school communities in supporting student mental health and well-being. And, and we recognize that language is constantly evolving and that terminology and language use evolve and change over the time. So the guide really aims to support a common understanding of mental health and substance use language across school communities and partners. So again, not just a common understanding of mental health and well-being within schools, but between schools and partners in the, in the school communities, such as public health and organizations. So the guide was developed over the past year. Um, the work uh, was guided by an advisory uh, committee made up of partners from education and mental health and public health and, and government and multiple branches of government. And the guide went through multiple rounds of reviews and revision, including um, from the advisory committee, from the First Nations Education Steering Committee, the Métis Nation, uh, BC, First Nations Health Authority, uh, and the Inclusive Education and Indigenous and Education branches at the Ministry of Education and Child Care, uh, uh, among others. So in developing the guide, we worked really hard to strike a balance between breadth and depth and brevity. So while it does take about 15 to 20 minutes to read, some might think of that as short, some might think of that as long, but um, the guide covers quite a lot of ground, as you can see here. And uh, next, I'll just quickly walk you through, um, through the guide. So I'll just pull it up. So, um, yeah, so this is the guide. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's it's in PDF form, but as you can see, uh, it, if, if you're sharing it at a presentation such as this one or at, at, uh, in your uh, in your line of work, whether on in person or, um, or online meetings, it, the each page can act nicely almost as a slide, like a PowerPoint slide. Um, and uh, the guide starts with an introduction, a brief introduction, as well as a, a land acknowledgement. Uh, it provides a little bit of background on the development of the guide, which, uh, which uh, both Danielle and I uh, just alluded to, uh, and then provides an introduction, a little bit talking about the why, uh, what, why and the rationale for, for the guide. And so digging into the meat of it, the, um, uh, the guide starts with uh, really just highlighting the importance of mental health and well-being in, in schools and school communities, and that uh, it put, uh, and just highlighting that the, that mental health is is central to uh, the work that is being done in uh, in schools. Uh, before uh, section two talks about how um, mental health is is culturally constructed, uh, and different cultures, or sorry, various cultures conceptualize mental health um, in different ways, and uh, and highlighting uh, as an uh, as an example of the First Nations perspective on health and wellness uh, developed by uh, the First Nations Health Authority. Uh, the next section, um, the next section uh, gets into defining what mental health is, and uh, as well as mental illness and mental disorders. Um, Section four highlights uh, the different states of mental health, and those of you uh, familiar with uh, the mental health literacy curriculum uh, will be will recognize the the pyramid of the different states of mental health. Um, section five talks about the importance of promoting uh, promoting mental uh, mental health and well being, including uh, protective factors uh, and the importance of protective factors for. Uh, Promoting mental mental well being as well as protecting against uh, mental uh, mental illness, and, uh, high, and and you know including highlighting social emotional learning's role in that. Section six really highlights that everyone in the school community plays a role in in supporting student mental health and well being, and, and talks about some different ways to do that as well as highlighting uh, compassion systems uh, framework. Uh, that's being used throughout uh, in many schools and school districts throughout BC. Uh, section seven highlights the importance of a strengths-based approach. Section eight highlights some common mental disorders among children and youth, um, including, uh, as you can see there, as well as uh, touching on neurodevelopmental disorders. 
Section nine uh, uh, talks about self-harm and suicide and highlights some uh, language that uh, that you consider saying instead of uh, some little bit more outdated language. Section 10 gets into substances and substance use, includes um, some like a, the spectrum of substance use, reasons uh, people might use sub, uh, substances, talks about harm, uh, talks about harm reduction, and then again talks about uh, some of the uh, language you might consider using. Uh, 11 uh, digs into trauma and uh, trauma informed practice, uh, which is a central part of the mental health and school strategy. Um, section 12 uh, gets into social determinants of health and how certain uh, and how these social determinants of uh, health can lead to different uh, groups being disproportionately affected by mental health problems and disorders. Section 13 talks about uh, starts getting into what are the role of different educators uh, within the school, uh, including how um, educators are not expected to diagnose students and, and, and gets into a little bit more of the role of school, some of the role of school counselors. 14 uh, expounds upon that idea by uh, expands upon that idea by talking about how, um, you know, what is the role of educators, including building that safe and caring, inclusive environment for students, not which we know is not just important for their uh, uh, learning, but also for their mental health and well-being and uh, highlights the importance of a distinction based approach uh, in doing so, as well as an intersectional approach. And 15 really builds upon that uh, intersectional approach and, and digs a little bit deeper into that. Uh, section 16 uh, talks about some of the, the various um, uh, mental health professionals that are based in schools and school districts and talks about how they can support student mental health and well-being. Uh, before getting on to 17, thinking about uh, the role that healthcare providers play in, in, uh, in, in student mental health and well-being, as well as including uh, like a big focus on uh, diagnosis and, and who can diagnose uh, who can okay. diagnose students and children and youth. Uh, and then 18 comes back to schools in terms of, you know, once a mental health need has been established, how can schools support uh, can support students? Uh, we wrap up by uh, by highlighting the importance of educational well-being, and not just as a, uh, as important for supporting student mental health and well-being, but also as important in its own right, and and different ways uh, and different ways to think about um, staff, uh, educator and staff well-being. And then finally, we wrap up with a brief conclusion. So that's the guide. If you have again, if you have any questions about it, uh, please put them in the Q and A. Uh, and this was just meant to be really quick. Uh, Walk through for those of you who have uh, maybe haven't had a chance to uh, see to see the guide, and it's a quick refresher for those of you who uh, who have had a chance. Um, I do want to mention um, I do want to mention that we've developed a promotional poster that you can use um, to uh, to share the guide. You can print out and put up in a staff room or something like that to share the guide, uh, and my colleague will put that in the chat. All right, and uh, so next, I think we'll have some time to dig into the uh, uh, to conversation with our our, uh, our uh, panelists. So I'm really uh, pleased to uh, to have them join join me today here to talk about the guide and how it can be used in school communities. So um, yeah, so uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Carrie McDougall. Uh, Carrie is the project leader for the Healthy Schools Program at Fraser Health. She uh, has has been with Fraser Health since 2017, and prior to that, worked as a at a nonprofit organization for school health promotion Dash BC. And Carrie has a master's in public health with a specialization in health promotion from the University of Alberta. She's also a sessional instructor at Simon Fraser University and lives in the Tri Cities with her family. Uh, Next, uh, we have uh, Mike Hook, Mike Hooker. Uh, Mike has been an elementary teacher, a vice principal, and a principal at the elementary and secondary levels. She was a superintendent of school, uh, sorry, he was a superintendent of schools in Revelstoke from 2013 until his retirement in 2022. Uh, he would say his primary goals were to understand how to best help adults and develop meaningful connections with children and young adults in schools and to build and nurture those relationships himself. He's currently working with the BC Children's Hospital Health Promotion team, so that's that's my team. So I'm, I'm, I, have, I have the pleasure of working with him as a practice support coach, uh, where he supports districts in their efforts to create uh, mental health strategies and plans to support student and staff mental health and well-being, as well as uh, build connections with each other and in their communities. 
Uh, and finally, I'd like to introduce uh, William Nichols Allison. Uh, Will's a, a school counselor in the Greater Victoria uh, School District. Uh, he's also the publication chair for the British Columbia School Counselors Association and editor of uh, BC Counselor Magazine. His research and publications focus on child and adolescent development, mental health and social justice, including uh, guaranteeing access to mental health uh, care for every child. He has presented to colleagues and graduate students on children's mental health, uh, the person-centered approach, and trauma-informed practice. So I'm really pleased to have uh, the three of them uh, joining me today to uh, talk about the guide. So thanks for joining me. Um, great. So uh, so I'm going to uh, start. I'll, I'll ask the, uh, all three of you the same question, and uh, we'll kind of move through, and we'll each give each of you an opportunity to ask that. So um, maybe I'll start with uh, Will, since I introduced you last. And the first question I want to ask to the three of you is uh, just what do you like about the guy? So, Will. Thanks, and uh, nice to see how many participants there are here today. Um, when when you first pitched the idea of the guide to me, I already knew what I liked about it, which is just getting everybody on the same page. Um, you know, stigma is such a barrier to uh, mental health and to mental health care, and creating such a concise but really clearly worded guide around the most important issues in mental health and substance use, um, so that we all have the same language across the province. I just thought, what a great idea uh, from the from the moment I I got the the pitch email. So. Yeah, I think the guide offers a great opportunity for educators um, and allied professionals all across BC to to connect with each other with a shared language and a common goal to help our kids. Hey, thanks, Will. Uh, Carrie, can I put the same question to you? So what what what, do you, what did you like about the guide? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Alex. And thanks so much for having me here. Um, thanks, so I think the guide is so valuable because it offers shared language. It integrates multiple frameworks and is a connection tool for partners, which is particularly important when working across sectors, um, especially in topics such as mental health and substance use, when, as we can learn from the guide, uh, that with mental health, for example, there are various ways mental health is conceptualized. There's different states, variety of factors contributing to mental health. So I like that the guide is a tool for partners to come together for discussion, um, to strengthen our partnerships by having common language, and hopefully use the guide to identify opportunities for coordination and collaboration based on this common understanding. Thanks, Carrie. And Mike, over to you. Sure. Yeah, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with Carrie and Will, of course. With the uh, for me, three things really stood out. Uh, the first off, the lay the layout itself is very reader friendly. And, and I think it's the it's really it struck that balance between informa information and detailed information and then quotable phrases and graphics. Uh, so I think this format makes it very reader friendly. And it uh, again, back to that wider audience, it's going to be from students and their parents and right through to school staff and communities. The second big one for me was without getting into the detailed tiered nature of supports, it, the guide addresses each of the areas, again, using that accessible language and represents that represents you know, the tiers. Uh, from good for everyone right through to intensive supports and finally i really like the use of the footnotes and links that were in there where it's very jargon free but where there was a little bit of jargon that it couldn't be avoided like the the foot and the footnotes define like for example stigma so that clarifies and keeps it accessible for everyone um, and then the inclusion of the learning links like that youtube that provided the feedback on and or the backup explanation i guess on the on that mental health pyramid just took you away to a three minute video. It's a quick reminder. So if, if you feel like you didn't know what was happening right there, you, you click the link, away you go, and it brings everybody to that, back to that common language part again. It keeps it on an even playing field. All right. Thanks, Mike. Great. Um, so the next question I have for the three of you is like, what parts of it did you find most interesting or relevant for your work? So uh, Carrie, uh, or maybe I'll start with you this time. Yeah, sure. Uh, so there's lots. <laughs> uh, but one of the parts of the guide that I found most relevant, maybe from like a systems or partnership perspective is point 13 about how educators are not expected to diagnose students, but do play such an important role in noticing changes. And I think we know that educators are quite good at noticing changes in students and often one of the first adults to notice changes. Um, so this is relevant to our work because as public health partners, we can support with linking to services and, and 
navigation. Um, and I know some of the Healthy Schools nurses that I work with have partnered with school districts to support navigation for schools and families to mental health and substance use resources and services available in the community. So to me, um, these types of projects are a systems approach to Section 13. Great, thanks, Carrie. And how about, uh, Will, can I toss to you as well, to you next? Yeah. So what part of it did you find most interesting or relevant to your work? Yeah, I'm with you, Carrie. Uh, Section 13 and, and then 14, as you were saying, Alex, it, it kind of expounds on that as it goes on. I'm just so glad that that's, that's in the guide and that it's addressing a very common concern that I hear from many educators that, um, that I work with and, and from colleagues across BC. Because um, many teachers are feeling feeling the stress and feeling the strain of the increase in child and youth mental health needs across our province right now. And of course, the needs end up in the classroom. And uh, teachers are not mental health professionals, um, by and large. And so they're facing um, these unique challenges. So I just really love that in section 13 and 14, with very little jargon, as Mike said, uh, we have some really clear uh, guidelines that can help all educators. Um, and then, of course, I, I have to bring up um, something that I like about sections 13 all the way up to 18 is that it helps to enhance the awareness of school counselors as qualified mental health professionals who are working in the schools. We have resources in the schools. School counselors are excited to do this work. Um, we're here and uh, we're here to support our colleagues. So I, I love that that's something that's really uh, that's really elevated in the guide as well. Great. Thanks, Will. Uh, and Mike, over to you. Sure, good. I appreciate Carrie and Will. You you pulled out a, a particular section. I'm looking at it as an entire in terms of that entire document. From considering that most, if not all, school districts are developing specific plans and strategies that guide their efforts around mental health now, and many of them have created even actually the overviews or frameworks. Um, I can see the guide being really useful for mental health teams and as a bit of a, as a resource tool uh, to review their own work and and have a critical look at the language that they're using. And then make adjustments because our language and knowledge and understanding is continually evolving around mental health. And then for districts that are in the early stages of creating plans, the guide itself, I think, is going to be useful for, for beginning and supporting conversations around the need for those plans and frameworks. Um, and that reflects that the, the, that provides the opportunity to reflect the, the school communities, their, their own values, but, but still with a, with a broader provincial picture. And I think that added bonus of the common language guarantees you're extending beyond your own district so when you're when you're that that in itself will facilitate shared conversations across the province from district to district because we're 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 working from the same beginning place all right great i, I really am enjoying the the various and different perspectives you all are bringing uh so i'm really appreciating that um so i guess um my last question before we get to the Q and A, um, and if you do have questions, just so I'll go up to the audience, if you do have questions for the Q and A, please go ahead and put them in in there, and um, and don't wait. Um, so my last question for the three of you is just so beyond sharing the link of the guide to a colleague or just recommending that they read it, how could uh, how do you think you could use use the guide or roll it out in a school setting um, or with 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 school partners? So Mike, maybe I'll, I haven't started with you yet, so maybe I'll start with you on this one. Sure, okay. Uh, I, I think two two areas uh, jumped out for me in that. The, the first one is, again, back to that um, use of effectively uh, an effective catalyst for conversation. I can see a mental health team taking a few minutes at the beginning of their regular meetings to pull a concept what, right from one to 19 and let, pull one out, um, uh, discuss it, share a quick reflection, I can see principals uh, using a, a similar kind of activity at the beginning of, as a welcome and a warm up to the start of staff meetings or a parent advisory council meeting. And I think actually right to, uh, you could actually classroom teachers uh, where appropriate at, at the start of a start opening discussion at the start of activities in a classroom, whether or not it's specific to a mental health conversation you're about to have or not, just that it becomes an integrated part of the language. And it's a nice way as a warm up activity. And I guess the second one I, I think of in terms of what kind of relates to the planning, I think the structure of the guide that makes use of those bulleted points throughout to highlight specific concepts, I think that really lends itself well to action planning kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, a mental health team, back to that again, if they, I mean, if, if they're focusing on trauma-informed practice, for example, uh, they could use those, there's those five key bulleted areas 
uh, as STEMs to review the actual steps that they're taking right now and, and or that or that they want to take to address those areas. So for example, at first, thanks Alex, the, the, the building, uh, build a safe, compassionate and trusting environment. So let's, let's start with that one and let's respond to questions like, what are we currently doing? How's it going? And are there things we should stop doing or start doing more intensively? And I guess these are just important starting places for planning teams that uh, that offer that regular review and update and, and uh, in terms of just a reflection, an, an ongoing reflection discussion and document. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, a lot of great ideas there. So um, maybe, uh, Will, can I turn it to you next? Yeah, sure. Um, I love that phrase, Mike, catalyst for conversation, because all four of the ideas that popped up for me when I, I first read this question are, are about that. Um, something I love that we do at my school is every time we have a staff meeting across the whole year, we take just 20 minutes to look at the same document together, but to read one more section. And I love that approach because instead of it being about ticking a box and being like a one and done thing, it's an ongoing, evolving conversation and that we're, we're growing our understanding together because that's how schools function best is when we're working as a team. Um, Something I love that we do in our district is that we have these counselor collaboration sessions where counselors from various schools are getting together and, and having some time to connect with one another. And um, I see this resource as being not only a wonderful resource for counselors, but also learning support teachers and other specialists and so on to possibly use during those collabs. Um, as a former practicum student, I would have loved to have had something like this during my practicum. And I, I meet so many practicum students um, who are just hungry to learn more about mental health um, and, and who, who are, are dying for this kind of information to be in, in a, a nice little package like this. So like you said, a 20 minute read, practicum students can handle that. They're, they're doing lots of readings. Um, and then the last thing is that, um, you know, just having community resources available physically in the school, um, you never know who's gonna pick up that binder and, and have a right, uh, you know, read what's in there and, and it might catalyze one of those conversations, so. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So, Will, when you're talking about practicum students, are you talking about counsel, counseling practicum students doing their counseling practicum, teacher practicum, both? Yes, both and, and okay. more. You know, like there's so many different practicum students who move through schools. They might be doing their practicum in speech and language pathology, or they might be doing their um, their practicum in, in child and youth care. Um, and ultimately, all of us who work in the school system are here to, to serve the students. Um, and all students benefit from having having professionals that are informed about mental health. Great, thanks, Will. Carrie, over to you. Yeah, I think Mike and Will both had some really great and uh, practical ideas. Um, so I think the tool can really, like I've said before, um, be used to build and strengthen partnerships with public health and other healthcare and service providers. So. Um, bringing people together to have conversations about the guide. And I really like the idea of maybe like one section at a time. So this can include um, have like from the public health side, maybe how districts are addressing some of these topics, um, discussing opportunities to, to support or build on existing work. Like I think of a lot of our team members who are working alongside their districts to co-develop mental health frameworks and how they might bring that out to um, into the school district and the schools or, or mental health promotion days where they bring students together. So I think it's an opportunity to use this guide to build on existing works, just those types of projects, um, and then discuss how public health and other healthcare partners can support with this work as well. So this is something that will encourage our healthy schools team to do with their school district and, and school partners. And then amongst our team, we'll also have conversation about how might they use the guide with their partners. Um, I think I might take some of the ideas from Will and Mike and maybe just have discussions as our team about like one section at a time and what that means for us, uh, maybe from a public health perspective, as well as from, from our school partners. So this can help you know, give more examples of how the team's using it and maybe spark further ideas. Um, and I think I just also think it's important to emphasize that across the province, public health is a keen and available partner for schools and school districts to support health promotion, including the topics that we're talking about today, mental health and substance use. Um, so in our context, I think we'll primarily be using this guide um, as a partnership tool. Great. So I think, yeah, I heard a lot of great ideas there from at the district level, at the school level, at the partnership level, a lot of, and also in, at the uh, university level in, in terms of 
uh, practical students coming in, how uh, how how the guide can be used. So great, thanks thanks for all your answers. Um, again, just to call uh, to a call out to the audience, if there's any uh, any questions you all have, we have some really great uh, folks here uh, that you can uh, dig into their expertise on. So uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. So um, the first question uh, that we have um, is, uh, and all, any of any or all of you would love to hear what you have to say. Um, who do you believe would be uh, one of the best audience members or uh, kind of uh, staff groups to uh, to roll out this resource to? So there's so many staff come to uh, come to the uh, school counselor with an expectation. So like, for example, so many staff come to the school counselor with an expectation of like fixing a kid. So like, how would you think about how to, how to what, which groups you think would be most important to or best to roll this out to? So I'll answer that. Um, I'll throw that out to all of you. anyone. Anyone want to take a first go at it? I can take a first go. Um, thank you for that question. And um, my my answer might sound a little bit evasive, but um, I think about schools as being um, a holistic entity. And, and so all I would say all of the groups in the school uh, to be learning this together as a collaborative whole. Because one of the things that makes school such a such a powerful place for, for enhancing and, and supporting students' lives is the fact that there are all these people who have different skill sets and different backgrounds um, and different interests and different life experiences. Um, so bringing all those different professionals together, school counselors, teachers, educational assistants, administrators, speech and language pathologists, visiting nurse practitioner, like there's, there's an endless list of people who, who are involved with the school. Um, so my, my first uh, thought is let's learn this together you know, as, as a team. And that way we can actually really share um, our differing skill sets with one another and really, um, you know, uh, use our advantage of, of being an interdisciplinary team. So I hope that addresses your question. Maybe I could just extend on that, Alex. Just oh, so, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Just really quickly, just I, I, I like that, Will. And I think that um, one, I think the, if the question also is related to the, the counselor receiving a have, have, trying to help a teacher that's trying to fix a kid, I think was the mm -hmm. example. Um, I, I think that the document itself lends itself really nicely to be able to say, to to pull out a, that, that sounds like a question about this. And so it's a learning opportunity as well. So that the counselor is not left at the language trying to explain to a colleague all the background reasons why we shouldn't use this language or that language or why we're not going to try and quote fix the kid today but but here's some background information um and and again starting with that friendly language piece again to, to pull it out that way and i think i'll just add to add on to what will was saying how it's um you know everyone within the school or a district um but if you're on the webinar or you just read the resource guide and you're just very excited about it is there's so much evidence around the value of having champions so if mm -hmm. you feel excited i would say just go for it and find the opportunities maybe especially the suggestions that uh, will and mike gave about ways to incorporate it um, and so i think if you're excited just be the champion to to bring it forward yeah, great. So I think maybe building on that, Carrie, like, do you think besides like if you're someone who might just be that champion to bring it forward, like, do you think that there are people who might be best placed in schools to uh, to 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 roll it out or to kind of lead some of those discussions? It's hard to say, I don't like, because I don't work directly in a school who might be the best, mm -hmm. but I think some of the examples given today, like at a staff meeting, if there's a champion who wants to bring, maybe it's just one section that you're really excited about. I know both Will and I mentioned um, section 13. So it might feel like, a, and especially you could think back of common discussions perhaps mm -hmm. that are coming up in staff meetings. So maybe if um, some of the staff are feeling like, pressures of having to diagnose a student, that's a great opportunity to bring in certain sections of the guide. Um, and so I think each school might function a little bit differently. So if there are those kind of opportunities to even just bring in a piece of the guide, I think that could be helpful. Uh, how about Mike or Will, do, do you think anyone is better placed than another to to bring these conversations forward? Kind of, I, I, we, so we hear from Carrie, maybe that mental health champion, but um, yeah, Mike and Will. 
Yeah, I, I would just add, and I think it's going to lead into that next question as well. I, I think that it's a shared responsibility and that if there's an expectation that everyone, um, if, if I'm just thinking about as a, as a school principal, I'm thinking about the importance of having everybody from bus driver to custodian through to through to um, uh, everybody that's in and out of the building, understanding that they, they own a little piece of making sure that this is safe and healthy and, and, and supportive environment for, for kids. And that part of that responsibility is understanding some of the some of the things that are impacting them, and this is a common a common language piece. I, I think it's everyone's responsibility, and and sure. and and it leads into that next question, which is um, like we we need to like it isn't a matter of time and and learning new concepts. Um, it's 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 just it's a responsibility that we have to the health and growth and development of children, and so it isn't an extra. Mm -hmm. in that regard. So everyone's responsibility. But certainly the notion of highlighting them at different spots, like just, just just the access points. So you don't have to go to Will's office to get the guide. You can actually see some of it on the wall in your staff room when you're just taking a quick break. If you're getting a break, and probably you're not, but but in in, in those areas. So so making it available. Great. Um, so I guess, uh, I think you start to allude to this one, Mike, but for you, any of the three of you, uh, if you have any ideas on like any, any suggestions on how to combat, uh, the, uh, eye roll cut, like, you know, like the staff who might be rolling their eyes when uh, a leader may, um, bring this up in, um, um, in a meeting or, or with their, with their staff or whether it's a leader or the champion. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of curious cause like, you know, these, these, these are, how to, how to combat that in practice because you know we maybe we can imagine that happening for for some staff you know recognizing that their staff are busy and have a lot going on like any ideas on how to combat that kind of eye roll idea people thinking like oh here we go again such an important question um it's always hardest um you know it's it's easy to to convince the people who already believe it um, and and yet it's really important to be able to get those who don't yet believe on side, um, and uh, and we need we need everybody on board. So uh, in my experience, real real stories, uh, personal stories, and connecting the people, um, you know those those little victories of uh, the kid who uh, was was too scared to get in the swimming pool for eighteen weeks in a row. And because they got help, they were able to face their fears. You know, those real stories about the people that we've supported and, and also from our own lives, uh, those, those are the ones that connect with those um, harder to convince folks. Um, and I, I think it's, it's a big part of our, our work as, as educators and as, as health professionals as well, is to help people who um, may be resistant to uh, some of this information to be able to, to connect them in a way that makes sense for them. Um, so yeah, they they just haven't just haven't been convinced yet. That's all. I think that's really great. Well, I was thinking something along the same lines around the theory to practice. And so I think the practice part is the experience. And so it could be about sharing experience if it's working directly one-on-one -on -one with a student. I even think of, you know, there's so much data available. So I think of the adolescent health survey data, MDI data, like there's so much. And so that could also help kind of pull in um, maybe examples that are happening within the school and then look, looking more broadly across the district. This is what the data is saying. And then you could start to pull out some relevant um, sections of the guide that could be helpful and you might not ever get everyone on board at once sometimes it can take a while um, to bring everyone in but uh, at the point that will raised about little bits at a time could probably mm -hmm. support that so connecting the, not just theory but the practice maybe through the data or through stories is what i heard from will and then that manageable chunks piece might be another way to make it less overwhelming and avoid that yeah okay great um and uh, I, guess, I think we have time probably for one uh, more question. So I, I do want to preface this question by saying the guide was not uh, developed for parents, guardians, and caregivers as a as like a key audience. But just kind of curious your thought on do, like if you think that it might be useful for those for that that like you know that parent fam parent caregiver guardian family audience. Uh, I'm just kind of curious to to hear your thoughts on that. 
maybe I could start with that one then because sure, I agree. that was a large part of what sort of struck me is that although it wasn't designed specifically for that, I can really see and thinking in my own experience how much I would have liked to have had that to, to be able to share. Um, for example, at, 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 at any time you had parents in your building um, or the, any time you had an opportunity to share and I sort of, I guess it feels like it pulls up a little bit of a see what's behind the curtain for staff. Um, mm -hmm. so it's sharing with community partners this is what we're thinking about and talking about at a professional level in terms of uh, health and welfare at school about for, for your children. And this is the responsibility that as, as educators, we've, we feel that we, we know we own and it's some background. And I think that the, this document does it because the language is, is still accessible enough that it's, it's not going to cause confusion or, or up, up, upset without, without a, that, that where it needs some kind of um, um, further dialogue or background background information. So absolutely, I think it's an excellent document to be sharing. I agree. Oh, okay. I'll echo you, Mike, and, and just say that, you know, the basis of the guide is that language matters and a tool to bring a number of people together for that common language. And of course, parents are such an important part of that, especially when you think, um, accessing mental health supports can be from a number of different places. And so, um, again, having some common language and maybe even to support parents in being able to articulate and define um, some of the things that they might be seeing or concerned about or needing support with. So although it's not geared towards them, I think it can definitely be used by parents and caregivers. Yeah. Um... I, I'm with Mike and Carrie. Uh, you know, so many of the parents that I've met over over the years working in education um, are just so curious, and they, and they want to know more. Um, and you know, you can send them uh, lots of links and that sort of thing. Um, but also having this little power pack document that has so much information in one place, I can see that being really supportive. And um, I noticed in the chat, you know, somebody referencing protective factors and. When we're talking about protective factors, there is one protective factor that is more powerful than anything else, and that's a, that's the support of, of a supportive, loving presence and um, a parent in a child's life. Parents are are the key to um, really supporting children's well-being, and if we really value our kids, we have to support the parents too. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just really want to echo the sentiment that this guide uh, could be very supportive to to uh, parents and guardians uh, as well. Great, thanks so much. Unfortunately, I, we, I saw a couple more questions come in just at the end, but unfortunately uh, that's all the time we're gonna have. So I just wanted to thank uh, Carrie, Mike and Will for uh, sharing, coming on and sharing your expertise and insight. I think uh, hopefully uh, hopefully, folks are coming away with um, a great, uh, uh, with a deeper insight of how of, of the guide and also how, how it can be used. Um, so with that, uh, I think we'll turn it back over to Michelle for a quick, uh, quick wrap up. So thanks. Thanks. Ooh. There we go. Thanks so much, Alex and panelists and participants, everybody for joining. That was uh, such a nice discussion and dialogue around the guide itself. Um, Maybe just in uh, in closing, or just to to pull in some of the themes at at PHSA, we've been gifted um, six Coast Salish teachings, and one of the teaching is Natsamat or We Are One, um, and that was the intention behind the development of the guide was to really help to align us and unite us across communities and across sectors. Um, in the work that we do. And it was it, the theme just came out so, so beautifully in the discussion and the conversations that were happening about the, the ability of this to bring us together as one as we all work towards the same goal of supporting child and youth mental health and well being. Um, so in closing, just to encourage you to please, of course, like read, read the guide, dig into it, share it with others. Um, and if you're interested in staying connected with us, learning more about resources that, that we have through our school health promotion team or Kelty Mental Health Resource Center, please um, feel free to sign up for our newsletter through our website. Um, and then just a couple last few housekeeping pieces that I'll put, we'll put a email address up if there were questions that you have or, or things about the guide that we didn't get to, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and there will be a survey, as I mentioned, that pops up. We'd love your 
feedback on this webinar as we look to, um, you know, be hosting webinars in the future. So we'd love to hear your feedback. So thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful day and uh, have a great have a great afternoon. Take care.